Well, as we continue to prepare our hearts to receive God's word to us this morning, let's go to God together in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we are going to jump back into our walk through the Gospel of Mark. We started this a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I think this morning you're really going to start to get a feel for, for the Gospel of Mark's style, for his writing. You're going to start to get a feel uh, that, that Mark is kind of no-nonsense in telling the story of Jesus. And lots of things happen really, really quickly. Uh, so if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we read the first half of chapter 1. Uh, we saw Mark introduce this whole story as good news. Uh, we, we met John the Baptist, we saw Jesus being baptized, we saw him being tempted out of the wilderness, and that's where we ended a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we're going to pick up in just a moment uh, from there, but I want to offer you one more invitation before we jump into this. Uh, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, one phrase that I want you to keep in mind as we're walking through this series together uh, is this phrase that I'm borrowing from a theologian, Marcus Borg. Meeting Jesus again for the first time. So often, when we come to stories of Scripture, we don't come with fresh eyes or hearts that are eager to learn. We come and we hear a story and we say, oh, I know what that means, that goes in that category. And, and, and Jesus, the person of Jesus, the story of Jesus doesn't captivate us, doesn't enliven us, doesn't enrich us. We kind of just go, oh, okay, I've heard that story before, now what next, okay? I, I want to invite you to try and put that aside as best you can. As I'm reading through the gospel this morning, I want you to imagine that you're hearing this for the very first time. We are people gathered here who profess that we love Jesus. I want us to meet Jesus, Jesus all over again for the very first time, to be captivated by him, to be amazed by him, to wonder at who he is. So as I read through that, I, want, I just invite you to keep this phrase in mind. I want, to hear, I want you to hear this with fresh ears and a fresh heart. So we're going to be reading the last half of chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 14, uh, and then I'm going to read all the way through the end of the chapter 45. So it's a nice big chunk of scripture today. Uh, so, friends of Christ, I invite you to listen to the word of the Lord together. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets, and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of it with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, 
they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her. She began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you! Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man of leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks you get a feel for how Mark tells this story? This is just chapter 1, okay? <laughs> There's a lot that happens just right there in chapter 1. Mark is no nonsense and stuff happens quick. So, as we listen to, uh, to the Gospel of Mark like this together, uh, I want to acknowledge that this is a little bit of a different way for us to walk through this. Most of the time when I would preach on the Gospel of Mark, I would pick one of these stories, right? And I would preach on that story, we would walk through it, we would talk about it, we would kind of draw a whole bunch of stuff out of it. Uh, but, I want to do something a little bit different with us today. Instead of just focusing in on one particular story, I want us to see what all these stories say together. I want us to see what all of these stories uh, have in common, how they're connected, and I want us to start to see how Mark is introducing us to Jesus. So, we're just going to kind of walk through some things together, okay? So, at the beginning of our passage, uh, John the Baptist is put in prison, uh, and then the focus of the whole book shifts over to Jesus, and we get to hear Jesus speak his very first words of this whole book, okay? Again, this is significant. This is how Mark uh, chooses to tell the story. This is how Jesus introduces who he is and what he came to do. And what does Jesus say? The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the first words. These are the first words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark. And in these words, in this proclamation from Jesus Christ, we're introduced to uh, a couple of themes that we're going to see running throughout the entire book of Mark. I, I just want to touch on these briefly before we keep walking through the passage. But one of the themes that we're going to see throughout the Gospel of Mark is this. The kingdom of God. The very first thing Jesus says is the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Jesus uses language about the kingdom of God quite often. He talks about the kingdom a lot. He teaches about the kingdom a lot. But today, that's not really language that we use when we talk about Jesus. Uh, but Jesus, uh, think about the parables, right? He tells a lot of parables that say the kingdom of God is like this. Or the kingdom of heaven 
is like this. And the very first proclamation he makes is that the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus wants us to know right away uh, that a kingdom has come near. Now, what's a kingdom? When I think of a kingdom, I think of something that's all-encompassing. Right? If there's a king and a kingdom, a king would look at their kingdom and say, I have complete dominion over all of this. Okay? Let's pretend for a minute, this is fun for me, let's pretend for a minute that I'm not your pastor, but I'm your king. Okay? You can start calling me King Marcus if you'd like to. Uh, but I, I would, would be looking out over all of you and I would say, I have dominion over you. Right? You have to listen to absolutely every... Thank you, Mark, for the bowing. I appreciate it. That's good. There's bowing coming from the balcony. Uh, but I would say I have control right, over every aspect of what happens. Right? I, 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 I am all-powerful, all-whatever, because that is my right as a king. Okay? When, when you enter into a kingdom, you submit to the rulership of the king. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven kingdom of God has come near. Essentially what Jesus is saying is, hey, guess what? Something all-encompassing is coming near. The invitation Jesus offers us is to completely change our lives. Jesus doesn't offer us an invitation just to uh, kind of keep him on the side a little bit. Jesus doesn't just come and announce that he has come to give us all a, a get-out-of-hell-free ticket if you will. But sometimes that's what we relegate Jesus to, isn't it? We say, sure, I'll believe in Jesus, I'll have my get out of hell free ticket, but the rest of my life I'll, I'll keep to myself, thank you very much. Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come near, something all-encompassing. It is the invitation that we receive, and that leads into the second theme that Jesus announces. The kingdom of God is near, so what do we do? Repent. And believe the good news. Now, I've told you this before, but it bears repeating. Uh, to repent means to turn around. Okay? So if I am walking this way, if I repent, that literally means I turn around and I go the other way. To repent is to completely change. Repenting is more than just kind of feeling sorry for something bad that we did. It's turning around, making a change in your life, and walking in a different direction. The kingdom has come. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus announces that he has come to usher in a completely new way of living. A completely new way of understanding the world. A completely new way of thinking and believing. Repent, turn around, believe the good news. Right from the start, the invitation is to completely is to live in a completely new kingdom. And everything that we see Jesus doing from here on out uh, builds off of these themes and this proclamation. That he enters in the kingdom of God and calls on us to repent, to turn, to walk with him, and to believe. Now I promised you that we weren't going to walk through story by story, but that's what we did uh, at the beginning. But uh, I, I want us to know these themes uh, because we're going to see them played out all throughout the next coming weeks when we go through this, okay? Uh, but we need to see what happens also in the rest of chapter 1, right? This is just a couple of verses right at the beginning. Uh, and in the rest of chapter 1, uh, we see Jesus doing a lot of things. So these verses, uh, repent, believe the good news, the kingdom of God is near. Uh, this is really uh, the only teaching or preaching that we have from Jesus in this chapter. Uh, the rest of it uh, is stories about things that Jesus did. Uh, and as we look at all of the actions that Jesus took, as we look at all of them together, we're going to pull out a couple themes, okay? So stick with me. And the rest of chapter 1, these are all the things that we listen to Jesus doing, okay? We saw Jesus calling disciples to follow him, and immediately they did, okay? We saw Jesus teaching in the synagogue, and people there are amazed, and they say, who is this? He teaches like he has authority. Uh, we see Jesus showing power over evil spirits, man in the synagogue, Excuse me, man in the synagogue uh, has an evil spirit. Jesus drives him out. 
We see Jesus healing the sick. He heals Simon's mother-in-law. He heals a leper. We see Jesus driving out demons and giving them orders. Right? He says, go here and don't say anything. We see Jesus retreating to pray. Just as his ministry was gaining popularity and he was starting to get people around him, what does he do? He goes away. Uh, and when it, I love this part too. When the disciples come to him and say, hey Jesus, everybody's looking for you. He says, okay, let's go somewhere else. Right? So we see Jesus retreating to pray. Uh, and we see Jesus ordering silence. He tells the demons not to say anything about who he is, and he tells the leprous man not to say anything. Right? He gave him strict orders not to say anything about who he was. But of course, the guy goes and tells everybody he can that Jesus has healed him. Okay, so these are all actions we see Jesus taking. These are all things we see Jesus doing in the, the, the first chapter of Mark. And as we look at all of these things together, a couple of more themes start to emerge. The first theme is this. Jesus has power. Okay? Imagine we're meeting Jesus again for the very first time. Imagine you've never heard these kinds of stories about Jesus before, and all of a sudden somebody starts telling you stories about a person uh, who does all of these things. And th this is just the first little part of the story. Okay? You would know and you would sense that there is something different about this person. Jesus demonstrates power in these stories. He has the power to draw people to himself, right? He calls disciples and they immediately follow him. He has power over evil spirits. He drives them out. He has power over disease and illness. He heals the fever and the lepers. Jesus demonstrates right from the get-go that he has power. All of these things that we just listed don't just happen. And again, for us today, when we hear all of these stories, generally our response is, yep, I know, right? We're not all that impressed anymore by stories of Jesus healing people. We're not all that amazed by the fact that Jesus can do all of these things. But put yourself in a place of hearing this for the very first time. Right away, you would know and you would sense that there is something different about this man. Mark wants us to know right away that Jesus has divine power. That Jesus is not just an ordinary teacher, but that Jesus has come from God and Jesus is God. Right away, we're introduced to the power that Jesus has. There's something else that we're introduced to. Uh, and I love this one. We're introduced to the fact that Jesus is unexpected. Okay? Uh, this is one, it's one of the many things I love about Jesus. But as we read the scriptures, we find that Jesus, in so many ways, is unexpected. Uh, let's go back through these stories again. Look at all these things Jesus does. Jesus unexpectedly calls fishermen to be his disciples. If you're looking to gather a team, normally you look for people with a lot of education, a lot of experience, a lot of this, a lot of that. Jesus doesn't look in the synagogues or the temples or anything like that. Jesus goes to these regular, ordinary fishermen, and he says, hey, follow me. Uh, they would have been people kind of of low social standing, not a lot of education, but Jesus says, follow me. This is who I want to be my disciples. This is unexpected, okay? Uh, Jesus heals a woman. He goes to the home of, of Simon, his mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus heals her. Now, Jesus was a, a Jewish rabbi. Okay? He was a Jewish teacher. Uh, it would have been expected that he would not have associated with women. He wouldn't have taught women. He wouldn't have healed them. He wouldn't have done any of that stuff. But right away, okay, uh, the very first healing of a disease, he drives out demons before this, okay? The very first healing of a disease we see is for a woman. The fever leaves her. This is unexpected for a person in Jesus' time, okay? Uh, Jesus unexpectedly touches a man with leprosy. So leprosy is this very contagious skin disease, right? So, so much so that you had to go live separately and people were afraid to be near you. Uh, and Jesus, 
Uh, the Gospel writer Mark makes a special point to say that Jesus touched the man. Did you notice that? As we read through, uh, Jesus could have just said to him, you're healed, but don't get any closer to me, please. I don't want to get what you have, okay? But no, Jesus unexpectedly touches the man, and the man with leprosy is healed. Uh, Jesus unexpectedly tells evil spirits to be quiet about him. We're going to see Jesus doing this all throughout the Gospel of Mark, telling people to be quiet about who he is and to not, to not to tell anybody else about who he is. This is unexpected. Normally we would think, doesn't Jesus want people to know about him? He doesn't. Jesus unexpectedly retreats, gets away from the crowds. Again, maybe our instinct would be, boy, no, we've got to gather as many people together as we possibly can. But Jesus wants to go to a different town. It gets so bad that at the end of the chapter, we're told that Jesus can't even enter into a city. He has to live outside in the lonely places. This is unexpected. Okay? And the, and the Gospel writer Mark is writing to uh, an audience that would have been expecting a different kind of of Savior, a different kind of Messiah. We're going to see, and we see this in other Gospels as well, but there were those in Jesus' day who expected the Messiah uh, to be some sort of military leader, right? to come and overthrow the Romans and to establish a new form of government there on earth. Uh, there are also other people who uh, kind of expected Jesus to be uh, this super religious guy uh, who would come and enforce all the rules from the Old Testament, be like a super Pharisee. Okay? To make everybody uh, be sure to believe and act and do all the same things. But what do they need instead? Instead they meet Jesus. They meet this person who has this immense divine power, but uses it in such unexpected ways. This person who spends time with a bunch of people he's not supposed to spend time with, who doesn't want to gather big crowds and influence, who invests his time uh, into people who uh, most religious leaders would have forgotten about or cast aside. In the first chapter of Mark, we are introduced to what I like to call an unexpected kingdom. Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God, but guess what? It doesn't look like, uh, like people in Jesus' day thought it would. And I would say for us today, the kingdom of God doesn't always look like we think it should look. Right from the get-go, Mark wants us to know that we need to put, put aside our preconceived notions about what Jesus has to be like, and instead, to meet Jesus. The real, living, flesh and blood Jesus, who walked this earth for you and for me. The Jesus who announces that the kingdom of God is near. The Jesus who invites us all to repent, to turn around, to, to join him in a completely new way of living and thinking. The Jesus who is filled with power, but uses it in such unexpected ways. The Jesus who heals a woman and a leper, people who would have been considered cast-offs. Jesus who calls fishermen, just kind of regular, ordinary folk, to be his disciples. As we think about all of these things, I told you it's a lot, okay? We're looking at a whole bunch of stories, and we're looking at big themes. But as we're thinking about all of these different things, here's what I want to ask you to, to reflect on today, and I want to close with this. For those of us here who call ourselves disciples, who call ourselves followers of Jesus, the question I have for you, the question I have for all of us, is what Jesus are you following? Who are you following? Are you following some sort of idea of Jesus? Or are you following the real Jesus? The one who walked this earth, the one who gave his life for you and for me, the one who rose again from the dead. It is so easy 
to follow an idea of Jesus. To not engage with, with the real Jesus that we meet in the pages of Scripture, but just to say, no, I got that all figured out. I'm going to keep Jesus over here in this part of my life because it's neat, because it's clean, because it's easy. But friends in Christ, the real Jesus invites us to repent, to turn around, to join Him in a completely new way of living and believing and understanding. Friends in Christ, who are you following? Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we confess to you today that uh, we often, God, follow an idea of who you are. We like to think that we have you all figured out, uh, that we can keep you in a nice, safe box in this part of our life. And God, we forget that you call us uh, to live in your kingdom. That you call us uh, to give you lordship over every aspect of our lives. That you call us to follow you uh, in unexpected ways and to unexpected places. God, we pray this morning that you would give us the courage to do just that. Give us the courage to see you more clearly. To see not just an idea of who you are, God, but to see the real you, to see your real love for us right here in this place this morning. And God, we pray that as we go through our week, as we uh, spend time with friends, as we spend time with family, as we go to school, as we go to work, as we do all the things that you've called us to do, God, we pray that we would give every aspect of our lives over to you, that we would Say, yes, Jesus, be king in our lives. God, we can't do this on our own. And so we pray for your spirit to move in our hearts, move in our minds, and open us up to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen.